The Faith at Work movement is on a cusp, destined for great things. God uses people from all kinds of walks of life and all kinds of professions to advance His kingdom. Work is a crucible that God uses to refine us. Everybody's work matters to God. The only thing that really brings lasting change is the gospel of Jesus Christ applied to every area of life. Leadership is people who can take other people's pain and turn it into passion. Are you overwhelmed by Jesus Christ? My first Faith at Work awakening was in 1966. 50 years ago, I was a junior at the University of California, Berkeley majoring in history, planning to be a, history, a high school history teacher. Now, I was studying with one of the great history faculties in the country. They, they used to tell us that, especially. But uh, what I, it, it didn't take me long to realize, I, I didn't really expect them to uh, reinforce my Christian faith, but it really dawned on me that in my history classes, no one ever talked about God being involved in human history. And they didn't, talk, they didn't actually like to talk about religion very much. And this is even in my courses on the history of the Roman Empire, uh, when Christianity was growing and about to transform the empire. And also, I took a course on the history of the Reformation, and very rarely was religion or Martin Luther's theological ideas mentioned in an explanation. It was economic causation and things like that. So here I am. Uh, becoming an expert, uh, so, you know, so to speak, in history, and yet at the same time, uh, in my personal life, we think about God being active in history all the time. I was a very passionate Christian, and so in my church, we're praying that God would be involved in whatever was happening in history. We, we believed that he'd been involved uh, throughout history, and so here I have two lives. On the one hand, my academic life and my future professional life, where God is bracketed out, and on the other hand, my personal life, my church life, my, uh, uh, my worldview, God is very much active. How can I bridge between those two things? One thing I was taught by my parents and by the church I grew up in is that Jesus Christ is Lord uh, all the time of every aspect of my life. My parents hadn't gone to college, but my, and you'd think they'd be terrified sending me off to Berkeley. But on the other hand, in the 60s, but you, my father mainly said one thing to me. He said, David, just remember, your mind belongs to Christ. Your mind belongs to Jesus Christ, not your professors out there. So I really believed that. And I believed that all truth was God's truth. And there must be some way of integrating my faith with my studies and what would become my work. Now, the problem was... Uh, when I tried to work at this project, my church really didn't have much to say about things like that. My church reinforced our doctrinal beliefs. Uh, even the campus Christian groups at the time didn't really talk about integrating your faith with your studies very much. It was mostly about learning how to have good habits of studying the Bible, being in a small group, sharing your faith on campus. All that's great stuff, but they weren't really helping me with that integration of faith and my studies and my future work. Uh, as time went on, uh, I looked at seminary catalogs to see what they offered. But you know, in, in all the seminary catalogs I looked at, uh, they had no courses on things like this. They studied the Bible in order to preach sermons. They studied theology in order to plant churches and defend the faith and things like this. But I had very little really to help me in the process. Now, eventually, I found the Conference on Faith and History, which was a group of of uh, Christians who were history teachers at secular universities as well as Christian colleges, and they put out a small journal, and I became friends through correspondence with a few of these professors who encouraged me. It was mostly, though, uh, Francis Schaeffer's writings that really challenged me to think about my field with the God who was there and really develop a Christian worldview. And it was the Mennonite Anabaptist tradition that drove me to think it's not just about having a worldview, it's about having a lifestyle. It's about living out my values uh, Monday through Saturday and not just on Sunday. So I didn't have a lot of help in those days. There, there were some uh, business groups, Christians in business. I had friends who were majoring in business who had a lot of the same questions as me. But even in some of those business groups, 
You were not supposed to talk about business, not, not even a Christian take on business. You were supposed to talk about, give your testimony on how God delivered you from alcoholism or from uh, your prostate cancer or things like this. And those are all great things in these business groups. But where are we going to actually talk about what Christ wants to do with the way I exercise my leadership or do my marketing or things like that? So there was not a lot, a lot of help in those days. There was some, and I really value the help that I got. But now, fast forward 50 years to today and ask yourself, what kind of resources do we have today? And it is incredible. Uh, and that's why two years ago, we brought together a summit conference. And today, uh, it's just amazing to see how we've grown. And we've got so many people who are interested and involved in these, uh, these things. There are seminaries all over the place that have programs and study centers and even dedicated professorships addressing this issue. There are pastors. Uh, we have our Made to Flourish network of pastors and churches that want to help their lay people to integrate their faith with their work. There are amazing numbers of marketplace ministry groups that provide support, corporate chaplains groups. There are books, uh, huge numbers of books on the theology and ethics and on workplace discipleship. We are so blessed. I just thank God every time I think about uh, what God has been doing. And one of the most amazing things my friend Al Erzman often points out is nobody's been in charge. It's, this is a God thing. God has been moving on the church, and we are so grateful. And the first thought we should always have is to celebrate the good things that God has done. But what uh, I think, and let's, yes, we should do that. So I ask myself, OK, what, where are we right now? And here's, here's what I would summarize for, uh, is, is what I call Faith at Work 101. I realize I'm an academic type, so I said 101 to 201. If, you were now, if you're a techie, you'd say Faith at Work 1.0, and then 2.0 is about to come. But Faith at Work 101, I think we have a pretty broad consensus, first of all, that everybody's work matters to God. Uh, not just pastors' work and missionaries, but everybody's work matters to God. Jesus wants to be Lord of everybody's work. That's the first point. The second point is every part of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation is the word of God to our workplaces. There's biblical teaching from cover to cover to guide us in letting Jesus be Lord of our work. A third point is that God doesn't just teach us didactically, but God exemplifies for us what good work is all about. We're made in the image and likeness of, of God. And so God's work as a creator is a kind of model for us. God's work as sustainer and redeemer is a model. And it's not just an external model, but it's in our DNA to a certain extent because we're made in the image and likeness of God. And it's not just looking back because looking forward, we're destined to be conformed to the image of God's son. So it's not just God's teachings about this, but it's God is the core model of what makes for good work. The fourth basic a consensus belief, I think, that we share is that we are in the workplace to be representatives of Jesus Christ. We're there to represent God in what we do and in what we say. So our character and the way we behave, the way we manage, the way we do our work is part of our, what God has put us in the workplace for. But it's also what we say so obviously that has to do with all forms of communication, the way we talk to people. It's also our great opportunity to share our faith in the workplace. That's where the church meets the world in large numbers, is in the workplace. That's where we have this incredible opportunity to share our faith. Uh, and the last thing I would say about this consensus is that we all know at this point that this is not a, a one-time individual uh, effort. We're not going to go away for a weekend uh, by ourselves and figure out how to be a faithful workplace disciple. It's a lifetime collaborative affair. This is an adventure for our whole life to constantly be asking, Lord, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to behave in the workplace? It's a lifetime thing, not just uh, achievable on a weekend seminar. And it's a collaborative affair. We can't do this by ourselves. We need brothers and sisters. We need a posse of prayer partners and discussion partners around us. And more broadly than that, we need the church to be part of this process. We need the seminaries to be part of it, the business schools. We need our marketplace organizations to be part of this. It's a collaborative 
uh, effort that we need to be involved in. But having said all of this, we, we need also to be thinking about what comes next. And so I'd like to just talk about two words. One of them is deeper and the other is broader. So I think that where we go next is deeper into particular job specialties. We can't just talk about work in a generic sense, but we need to help the lawyer to know, to understand how to integrate what the Bible has to say about law and justice with his or her law practice. We need to help the farmer to integrate what the Bible says about land and crops and workers with the way they approach their agricultural business. Or if you're a chef, what the Bible says about the table, the role of the table, uh, and hospitality and all of that. We need to go deeper into every job specialty. There are a lot of, there's a lot of work done on things like law, for example, but we need to go deeper into all these job specialties and not just leave it at a general level of, of work. We need to go deeper also into particular problems and challenges that cut across all of our work specialties. So for example, technology, even though we've got a lot of good things now on technology in a Christian view, we need to uh, increase that considerably as robotics take over a lot of our jobs, as communication issues uh, on the internet and within companies, we need to have a lot more attention on uh, technology. I would also say on financial issues, we need to continually go deeper into how we approach issues of profit and loss, uh, loans and interest, all of those kinds of things. There are huge needs for us to probe continually more how to understand money from a biblical perspective. Another thing I would say is Sabbath. We live in a world of, that's frantic, and we need to reappropriate and re-understand the place that God makes for rest and to understand Sabbath. And we can't just woodenly impose these things, but this is the word of God, and God understands how we're going to flourish in our work, and it's not going to happen unless we also understand Sabbath and rest. We need to be the people who are thinking creatively and presenting this to the workplace at large, so deeper. But we also need to go broader. And I think about broader, first of all, because by and large, the faith at work movement that I've been around is too pale and too male. Now, what I mean by that is there are a lot of organizations that I have been in. Yeah, let's clap, but don't use up too much of my time. Uh, it's too male in the sense that even in Boston in my recent time, I was part of a couple of, of uh, faith at work business uh, organizations that were just wonderful, but they were all male. And I tried to speak to the organizers, why don't we include our sisters? And they didn't want to make change. It's been doing the same thing too long. But basically, we cannot go any longer uh, without having most of our organizations include our sisters as well as our brothers. Uh, we ought to realize 50% of the body of Christ is female. That's 50% of the gifts God has given to the church, and I want to listen to those gifts. I don't want to just listen to my brothers. I want to listen to the whole body of Christ. Also, 50% of the workforce is, is female, at least, and, and we need to listen to our sisters as well as provide support to our sisters. We need their support. We males need their support. We need the conversation. And you know, in this world that is so messed up on male-female relations, who is going to show what a healthy, constructive, respectful, fair relationship is between male, males and females in the workplace if we don't show what that means? We need to work together with our sisters. And I'm not just talking about speaking to them, I'm saying we need to listen and learn from what our sisters say. And if it's true of women, it's true of people of color. Now, I sometimes resent that phrase because I say, look, isn't pink a color also? I mean, am I a person of no color? No, I'm not. I, I'm a person of pink color. But anyway, that aside, this is my academic problem bringing this up. But that aside, the reality is black work matters. Black lives matter. Black work matters. Uh, and brown work matters. And we need to include the full range of the people of God in our organizations. We cannot just have a bunch of white guys plan programs and then say, hey, everybody come and listen to our wisdom. No, from the very organizational day one, we need to include people of color and women in these planning meetings and think about those issues from their point of view. 
Uh, I think, uh, for example, uh, in the case of the African American church, we have uh, a hi they have a history. The African American church has a history of more holistic discipleship, where what happens in the church is really helping the whole range of people's. Uh, people's lives, including their economic lives, because the African-American church was excluded from corporate and political positions of leadership, and the church grew up as a more holistic support for people's lives. We need to learn from that history by listening to our African-American brothers and sisters talk to us about doing church in a more holistic way. And we could talk about, uh, about other groups that we need to hear for in the same way. But we need to be more broader in including more people. I also think we need to be broader in addressing the whole lifespan of work. If we just start talking about this when people are in college or get their first job, we're too late. We're way behind already. We need to get curricula in how to teach our kids in Sunday school classes to learn to look forward to working, even working as kids, uh, to do their work to the glory of God in their neighborhood or in their church or wherever they have opportunities. So we need to teach this to kids growing up. And when kids go off to college, we need to help them learn to ask the questions about God's calling. What is God's calling for your major? And then for the kind of uh, jobs that you might be looking for after that. We need to explore the other end of the lifespan where I am now of people who are beyond compulsory employment uh, retired, they call this sometimes. But you know, my vocation is not done just because I'm not getting a paycheck for it. No, I've got to ask God, what do you want me to do now? I can't run as hard as I used to, but Lord, I need to be continually using what you've given me to work for the glory of God. We need to have a much bigger perspective on what that means at the end of life. And then we need to address the crises in the middle because more and more of us are not working for one company our whole life, but we either choose to leave or we don't choose to leave, but we can find these serious interruptions in the middle of our career and sometimes more than once. We need as a church to gather around and say, how can we help people who are in the middle of these crises where they're unemployed for a while, they don't have health care? How can we help people in those mid-career crises? Finally, we need to broaden it to address the needs of those who have bad work and those who have no work. There are people caught in jobs that are dangerous or illegal or unethical, and they can't seem to get out. We need to figure out how to help them, how to mitigate the horrors of what they're going through, or to help them escape and support them in their escape. And then finally, in the case of no work, we can't just go through life griping about the government failing to create jobs programs, griping about the corporations offshoring jobs. No, we're a third force in the church where we need to step up. We have people who need to have jobs, who want work, they've got skills, they want to work, but they don't know how to turn those skills into a small business. But we have other people in the church who know how to do that, who could help them figure out how to create a small business, who could help them figure out how to do some social marketing, who could create a website. Uh, Larry Ward, who's going to be on the panel shortly responding to this, he and I invented a course in Boston, which we ran for three years, and we started uh, our students started 40 small businesses in Boston over three years. And now this last one was a couple years ago, and most of them are still afloat. Some of them are on life support, but the reality out in the world is that 80% of all startups actually fail within the first year. So the fact that ours are going and some are thriving is really an exciting thing. And it's because there's not only techniques of starting a business, there's a Christian community that gathers around and supports them. My last slide is of one of my heroes, one of my stars, Christine Page. I just talked to her on the phone uh, earlier this week to get an update on where she's at. But Christine needed a, needed a job. She lives in Providence, Rhode Island. Her pastor, heard about the course that Larry Ward and I were teaching up in Boston, and, sh and they drove up together for 10 weeks in a row to learn the basics of how to start a business, accompanied by a theological framework every week for what we, were, what we were talking about, a lot of prayer, a lot of rooting for each other, and gradually creating a concept and a business plan. She started her, she loved doing hair. People always wanted her to do their hair. She took some lessons from a little school about how to start hair, and so she started Bliss Salon. 
She said, I would have called it Bless Salon, and that's what I tell my customers, but I couldn't market Bless Salon, it had to be Bliss Salon, but she does hair, she does nails, all the rest of these kinds of things. And she did it with her pastor's support and prayer. She just moved to larger quarters after two years. She moved from a 700 square foot uh, place to a 1,900 square foot place to accommodate her two full-time employees and, and additional services. So here's somebody who started something out of, a, out of a passion to make her own way and to be a giver and not just a taker in life, to use her skills to help people be more beautiful. And so today, she's thriving, but she wants to move on to Faith at Work 201. So we were talking about, have you studied what the Bible says about hair. I mean, some of it's pretty, pretty terrible with uh, what happened to Samson, uh, what happened to Absalom with his hair. Uh, and then Paul warns, you know, you be careful about that outward appearance and braiding your hair in certain ways, this kind of thing. But you know, on the other hand, there's a whole other side to this where God made a world that wasn't just good for something, but it was pleasing to the eye. God cares about people being pleasing to the eye, and you help people who are feeling bad about that to, to be pleasing to the eye uh, in the way God has made them. You help people with that. But also, we remember that uh, what, what that lady did, who had the long hair, who massaged the feet of Jesus with her hair. And so here's a fabulous symbol for how your hair can be used to glorify God. We want to think about it that way. And you have this incredible opportunity. I was talking to Christine. You can teach these young people in your church not to get caught up in just their outer image, but teach them about the beauty of the heart and their character. And as they come, and you can help them with their hair, but you can give them this message. You have this opportunity to do things that your pastor can't do, I certainly can't do. This is Faith at Work 201. It's going deeper, and it's taking it broader. And my challenge to you is, are we going to be there to help and encourage this movement, not just to go further with 101, but to take, step it up to 201. Thank you.